is going to come to this diagonal and so erects this barricade of pawns to try to reduce the effectiveness of that, that bishop when it gets there. So black's knight was attacking the pawn, white bishop defending it. And the way black plays this opening is to let white take the center and later um, black will counter with either a pawn coming here or more rarely a pawn coming to this square. Though in fact it's the second pawn move that, that none is playing in this game. There it is. Koch and I playing very simply, um, avoiding any real uh, tactical complexity in the game. But the, this sort of position is, um, I think, theoretically rather in White's favour, his, his pawn in the centre, and the possibilities of, of advancing the pawn and pushing Black back make it a little difficult for Black to equalise. So again, quiet restraint by Korchnoi, pawn coming up just to stop Black's bishop developing. I think none here is, is trying to keep an eye on this square. The, the worry is that White will push this pawn forward and drive him back. So Black's queen and knight both guarding against an advance there. And White is still apparently preparing it. Now um, queen and rook lined up behind to help this pawn push forward. And the knight coming back. The whole fight's been over this square. We've now got two knights, queen, bishop, four black pieces covering that square. It is interesting how sometimes in the game you get this situation where you're fighting not over a piece, but just over an empty square. Yes, so often the, the strategy is actually quite clear that one side is trying to adv advance a pawn somewhere or to put a piece on a weak square. Um, here, there were various options for White earlier to actually to push the pawn here, but um, uh, I suppose they both decided that the pawn would have just been too weak there. So Korchnoi was preparing to, to ensure that the pawn on this square would be fully supported, but now none has stopped him moving it there at all. And just a, a quiet move, retreating the bishop. I find it very difficult understanding Korchnoi's play. It's, um, he, he gets such deep strategic plans that... Uh, do you remember the game of his earlier in this tournament when he, he dropped a, a, against Portish? He had this, that horrible loss to Portish where he found a plan of bringing a bishop back from this square to this square, then over here, and then he exchanged it, and then he decided that he needed his white-squared bishop. Yes. Um, nobody can understand play like that. When it works, it's superb. But sometimes he gets so tangled up in his own thought processes now that's just uh, restraining black on the queen side. Very quiet development. There's, there's little to say about these moves because the, the two armies haven't come into contact with each other yet. And there the, the development of both sides is complete and now really white must decide on what his strategic plan is. Uh, I believe two moves before with my advantage in space and superiority in the center, uh, well, I had a better game. But now we'll, when I move my knight from the queen side, I allow him counterplay on white squares. Well, c4, d3, and so on. And this, I feel, will happen. So, in this position, I, I have only one way. Well, go to f1 and eventually to e3, d5. Night of one. I'd really like to try and make something of those weak squares he's got on the queen side. Perhaps I could play knight a5 followed by c4, knight c5 with the threat to invade on either b3 or d3. But I don't really want to move the knight on c6 away from the centre just at the moment. But how then can I get hold of those squares on the queen side? Well, I could improve the position of my bishop by playing queen c8 and bishop a6. Yes, then I could play perhaps c4, knight c5, or knight a5, or knight e5 as appropriate. The bishop definitely seems to be better placed on a6 than on b7. Of course, I waste some time getting it there, but, well, it's not a position where tempo is going to be terribly important. So, queen c8. Yeah, that is that. Well, he wants to play bishop a6, and uh, knight a5, and knight d3. I have to develop my queen side quickly. Bishop G5. 
Oh, I'd better continue with my plan. Bishop A6. In the only move, Queen C. His move, Bishop G5, puts me in a slightly awkward position. I can't play knight e5 now because he just exchanges and if I take back with a knight, which is what I want to do, the pawn on e7 is undefended. For the same reason, I can't play knight a5. It certainly looks very committal to play c4 straight away. Perhaps I, I should do that, I'm not sure. But on the other hand, I can defend the pawn on e7 and then move the knight. Yes, uh, but which piece should I defend it with? If I defend it with a rook by playing rook e8, then after a subsequent exchange of rooks on the d-file, my defensive rook's going to be deflected. So I probably ought to use the queen. Yes, if I play queen b7, then when I move the knight away, the queen will defend the pawn. So queen b7 it is. Ah, oh, this is strange. I always have known he doesn't understand chess. What he is doing with his pieces? Well, he had to play f6, c5, well, to cut my bishop of play, and uh, my knight f1, and then to play, well, with a knight e5, with a knight a5 and c4, or, or somehow else, just to win on the queen side. Oh, it's a relief. Oh, but my move is obvious. I continue to develop my queen side. Rook a1. Oh, he's completed his development now. So I think I've got to go ahead with my plan. C4. So, C4. It's a new lemon. Well, he allows me, uh, well, to occupy the square D4. Now I have so many good moves. First of all, well, perhaps Kasparov would, would play like this. B4 takes, bishop takes B3, then bishop D5, then knight D4. Oh, yes. Well, a little bit risky. Well, Kasparov with Kasparov, I have my own style. Let's say, what about E5? Whether it works or not. It's a pawn sacrifice. Again, let well, allow it to Kasparov. My move is quite obvious. Knight D4. Bill, there seems to be a certain, how should we put it, lack of harmony between their minds over this game. Yes, Cortina just doesn't seem to believe a thing that John Nunn is trying to do. Uh, Nunn giving away squares in the centre to, uh, to try to launch a, a queenside attack. And Cortina just, just thinks it's complete nonsense. <laughs> well, let's see what happens and which of them's right. Oh, that's an unexpected and, again, a rather awkward move. If I play knight d to e5, he can play knight takes c6. I don't want to take back with my knight, he just plays f4. If I take back with the queen, though, he can take on d8 and take on e7, winning a pawn, or take on e7 first. Oh, this is starting to look really unpleasant. If I take on d4, he takes back with the c-pawn, and I, I don't have any squares at all for my pieces. But the immediate threat's just the threat to win the e-pawn. Perhaps I can play knight d to e5 after all. If he takes and queen takes, he wins the pawn, but I get my knight to d3. Yes, the knight's very active there. It's, it, b2 would be attacked. If he exchanges, then a4's hanging. Yes, I think that must be worth a pawn, or even if it isn't, I don't think I've got any better alternative. So I'll try knight d to e5. Yeah, of course. What else? Knight e5. And again, I have two possibilities. Uh, one is, say, uh, well, knight c 6 if knight takes e6, then he never comes to d3, so I play f4 with a good advantage. If he takes with queen on c6, I take on a 7 rook takes d1, rook takes d1, rook e8, knight, bishop a3, knight d3, and knight d2. And I'm threatening knight takes e4 and win. Well, instead of knight d3, perhaps he has the move f5, what looks a little bit dangerous. Well, uh, white has a pawn, but black has some compensation because of work to positions of some white pieces, including bishop a3 and bishop c2. Uh -huh. I have a normal move. Uh, a normal one is knight d4 to b5. I'm just not seeing any of his moves today at all. I expected him to take on c6, but he's played something completely different. Now he's going to play f4, driving my knight away from the central position and forcing me to go right back on the defensive. I've got to be ready to answer f4 with knight d3. At the moment it just loses a pawn. 
but I can prepare it by playing knight a5 here. If he then plays f4, knight d3, bishop takes, pawn takes, rook takes d3, then knight c4, followed by rook takes d3 and knight takes b2, and I get the pawn back. So knight a5 is a good counter to his threat. So the threat is knight d3, bishop takes d3, pawn takes d3, rook takes d3, knight c4, queen e2, rook takes d3, queen takes d3, knight takes b2 taking the pawn back with advantage. So my move, well, I defend myself against this threat and play queen e2. Well, perhaps we could have a little uh, slow motion replay of that, of what they're actually trying to do. Fortunately, there's one point in this position they do agree on, which is that white's trying to play pawn here to attack the black knight. If white can advance this pawn and drive the black knight away backwards, then Black's liable to get swamped on the king's side and in the centre with these two pawns advancing. So what Black's been trying to organise all the time is to answer this move with his knight coming in here. Now, if White had played the pawn here last move, um, Black's knight would have come here. You'd have had an exchange of bishop for knight on that square. Black would have taken back with the pawn. White rook would have taken that pawn. And Black's knight, which has been hanging around here waiting for just that to happen, would then have gone to this square freed when Black's pawn made the capture, attacking White's queen, on, which was on this square. And the knight attacking the queen on this square would have ensured that Black regained the pawn down here. So whenever the Black knight goes in here, Black's going to lose a pawn. He's preparing that pawn sacrifice all the time as his only counterplay. And uh, the manoeuvre of knight from here to here and taking this, was, it was the essence of the counterplay. So what Korshnoi has done is delayed the advance of this pawn, retreating his queen to make sure that it won't be attacked by being on this square, and he's preparing this advance to try to squash black. Uh, I think that's the only thing they agree about in this position. Ah, oh, what can I do? I really need to get this queen out. It seems to be in a box at the moment. But I can't go anywhere because it's got to defend a7 and e7. I think the thing to do is to at least relieve it of one duty by exchanging off his knight, because my bishop isn't doing anything anyway on a6. So bishop takes b5. OK, it is something. Perhaps he has calculated some variation. I don't know. Uh -huh. uh, so, pawn takes b5. Oh, I don't like the look of this at all. I, I think I'm going to lose a pawn in a few moves. But I think I'd better get my queen to a more active square. Queen c7. Aha, uh -huh. that's why he took on b5, because he needed the square c7 clear, and he could not retreat with his queen to the c line because of knight takes a7. Uh -huh. So now, now what I have? I have some interesting move, knight e3. Knight e3 was idea knight d5. But he can play queen c5. Oh, he plays f6. Knight e3, f6, bishop retreats, queen c5. And my pawn, b5, is hanging. No, I will try to win the pawn by playing f2, f4. f4. Oh, that's not totally unexpected. Well, I have to play knight d3 now, of course. Yeah, um, what else, of course? Oh, well, he's lost. He's lost. I take the pawn. You should take this. I just recapture with the pawn. And rook takes d3. A cultural, I may think that none's lost. Do you think none would agree? I, th I think I've un understood now what the confusion is in this game between them. Um, Cortional thinks that he's won a pawn, but none thinks that he's sacrificed a pawn. Ah. Um, it's a matter of semantics. <laughs> yes, yes, purely. <laughs> uh, Cortional does, does have two weak pawns as white, which I'm sure none has his eye on. I now see that. Uh... I've made a bit of a miscalculation. I'd intended to get my pawn back by playing f6, bishop h4, queen takes f4. But now I see that by continuing bishop g3, queen g5, b4, and then after knight b7, h4, my queen gets driven back to the disgusting square h6. And then would come something like rook a1, and my pawn on a7 is um, suffering a rather dreadful fate indeed. So, I have, in fact, just lost a pawn. Well, nothing to do about that. I just have to play on. I can exchange the f4 pawn for e7, and that must be a good idea, because it leaves him with a weak pawn. So I'll play h6. 
Yeah, so what? Bish page four. Now I gain a bit of time by exchanging rooks. Uh, queen takes d3. And then hitting his queen with rook d8. Well, I was more afraid of the move knight c4. Rook d8 is, uh, I believe it is a new lemon. Or a queen e2. Yes, that was the best square. But now we have this exchange of pawns. Yeah, of course. And I also take the pawn. Bishop takes e7. At least I can drive the bishop back to a possibly inferior diagonal here by playing rook e8. And bishop b4. And I have a pawn. I'm sure my position must be lost objectively, pawn down for no real compensation. But he is a bit short of time, so there's a possibility he might go wrong. The worst thing about my position is the knight on a5, so I'll just try and get it somewhere better. Knight b7. Uh -huh. So, some problems. Some problems that my pawns are weak. b5 and e4, and uh, the only square of which I can defend both pawns for queen is e2, but it is um, not good square because um, of confrontation on the e-line with the rook. But I will try to um, improve position of my pieces. Queen f3. I want an ending, yeah. That's a slightly peculiar move. I didn't expect that. Well, I can uh, attack a pawn now. It's my greatest achievement so far. Queen e5. And now... And now, my move... Well, I don't want to defend the pawn. Mm, uh, I play knight e3. He cannot take on e4 because of knight c2. Yeah. All his moves are unexpected, you know. I, I thought... Sure, he ought to be playing rook a1 at almost any move here and getting this pawn on a7. Instead, he seems to be just giving me the pawn on b5. Oh, well, what can his idea be? Well, queen takes b5. If he plays rook f1, I've got queen d7, but queen takes b5, knight d5 looks pretty nasty. Knight c7's threatened, rook f1's threatened. Various things to e7 are threatened. Well, now, I just have to bank on his time trouble, I think. Uh, He's obviously got something prepared here, but uh, we just have to wait and see what it is. Queen takes b5. Well, damn. Perhaps uh, instead of knight c3, rook a1 was winning on this spot. In that position, he was dead lost after rook a1. What, what was I doing? Uh, no, but still I have something. I have rook f1, knight d5. What, what's first? What's first? I don't have much time. What's first? Mm. OK, rook of one. Uh, Mamma mia, knight d5 was winning easily. After knight d5, queen d7, rook d1 wins on the spot. Uh, That's really quite irritating, isn't it? I mean, it's a bit like missing a couple of short putts. Carson, oh, I seems to have, have got very flustered in the last few moves. He's, he's missing everything. And just a couple of moves ago, when his, his pawn was on this square, white pawn on that square, he had the chance just to put his rook here, attack this pawn, almost certainly win this pawn, and invade with his rook. Now he's, he's missed that chance, and now he, he's just um, lined up queen and rook for an attack on here, but uh, feels it would have been much more effective bringing, bringing the knight in first. Um, I think the point is that black's queen is going to have to come back here to this square to defend. And um, by moving his rook first here from this square, uh, he, he's going to lose a move when he puts the rook on that square. I, I think White's just lost a move in his attack here, and um, he's given his pawn back, but uh, I don't see any White advantage anymore. Well, again, uh, his moves are unexpected, but uh, rather more pleasantly so than before. I was really worried about knight d5. But now my move's forced. I must defend f7, so queen back to d7. Uh, well, now I have nothing. Well, knight d5. Well, the knight finally comes there, but a bit late. I can shut his bishop off now by playing knight c5. Yeah, pawn before is hanging, I must take. Anyway, bishop on before is a dummy. Bishop takes c5. 
recaptures. And, uh, and I have to consider my failure. I failed to win this fantastic position. Well, at least I have to keep equilibrium here. I am a little bit worse. My pawn only four is weak. Rook d1. Well, I'm sure that this position is just uh, completely equal. Materials equal. His knight is well placed on d5. But on the other hand, my bishop isn't bad either. And enough simplification has taken place for the weak pawns on the queen side not to be terribly important. I've got to move my queen now because he's threatening knight f6 check. So I'll attack the pawn on b2. Queen b7. Rook d2, or pawn b2 is hanging. If I can get my queen to a good square where it attacks the pawn on e4, then he'll be tied down and he won't have any winning prospects whatsoever. I can't play queen a6 immediately, though, because of the possibility of knight c7. So I'll think I'll gradually improve the position of my queen. I'll go to c6 first, then I can go to a4 later to attack the pawn on e4. Yes, queen c6 looks like a good move. Yeah, yeah. Uh, rook f2. Uh, at least I attack pawn f7. Well, he's gone back to the attack on f7, but uh, he's just sort of going around in circles now. So I'll just put the queen back on d7 where it was before. Ah, it's difficult. A difficult lot uh, to defend such a position. Yeah, well, what can I do? Queen f4. Allegedly, I'm threatening queen takes h6. Possibly there's some sort of tricky threat here. Queen takes h6. Well, it's not a threat, actually, because I've got bishop e3 pinning the rook at the end. But um, perhaps I can play f5. I mean, that would be very strong if it really worked. But then he can play rook d2. And if rook takes e4, then queen takes e4, knight f6 check. Yes, I think f5 looks a bit risky if I'm not really certain that it works. But I can prepare it by playing my rook to e5. Then I threaten f5, and I also threaten to put the queen behind the rook and create a double attack on the e4 pawn. So rook e5. Now, yeah, now it turns out that I'm not threatening because of two reasons. Yeah, when I take on e6, he takes with the rook to d5. So I have to be very careful. I play... Rook d2. Well, he's threatening to win my queen, so the queen has to move. But in any case, I wanted to put the queen on the e-file. So, queen e6. And now the pawn is hanging, but by luck, I may attack the queen, and queen has no squares. Knight c7. Well, I can force a draw here by playing queen e7. He has to go back to d5, and I can simply return to e6. But I wonder if it's possible for me to play for a win by playing queen c4. There's no obvious way for him to defend the pawn on e4. He could perhaps try rook d8 check and rook d7. But then I have the nasty trick rook f5. And that must be a winning position for me. But I think perhaps queen c4, rook d8 check, king h7, knight d5. Yes, that's really nasty. He stops my rook f5 trick. And if I take the pawn on e4 with either rook or queen, then knight f6 check comes. And in fact, I would be in danger of losing then. So I should probably go back queen e7. Uh -huh. Not ambitious anymore. Mm -hmm. Knight d5. Well, having dismissed any possible winning attempt in the last position, I ought to have a look in this one. I could perhaps try queen g5, but... No, I, I'm not really convinced that I'm significantly better there. Even if I win the pawn on e4, the broken pawns on the queen side would make it virtually impossible to win. So I think the best thing is to be happy with the half point I've salvaged from this uh, miserable position I had earlier and simply repeat moves with queen e6. Well, I can think of a, a lot of players who wouldn't be happily going backwards and forwards with the, the queen here, but... Um... None seems, seems content to have saved this game. Uh, yes, Korshinoi is just, just repeating the position. None going back again. Uh, and I, I think that black has some small advantage here because of the weakness of this pawn. Several players would actually try to win this position as black. 
but none knows that he, he is morally obliged not to score the full point from this game, I think. Yes, that, that's, if I'm counting right, that's the third time they've had this position, each time with white to move, so yes, yes, they're agreeing a draw. It's a draw by repetition of position, same position, three times with the same player to move. Why do you say that John Nunn's not morally entitled to a point if he can get it? <laughs> Perhaps morally wasn't the right word. Um, I think it's a question of emotional adjustment to what's been going on in the game. Uh, many players, if they've been playing a game where they've been defending all the time, um, when they find themselves with a slight advantage, just uh, don't really have the energy, the impetus to go on to, to try to win. They feel so relieved at having saved the thing that, that they're happy to take a half a point. Now, Tony Miles, for instance, if he has a very slight advantage, having been defending for four hours, he'll play like a tiger for the full point. But, but John Nunn's much calmer. Interesting, I just heard that uh, Hübner has beaten Portish. Portish having a terrible time. Yes, that's, what, fourth, fourth loss in a row, is it? If not five, certainly four. Oh, yes, four or five. That, that must be unique for him. But he's, he's recently had this habit of starting tournaments very well and then uh, collapsing a little bit. Right. Well, the outstanding game in this round is the one between Nigel Short and Gary Kasparov. Nigel Short won the first time they met. He is two points behind with two rounds to go.